conversation led by the inspired CEO of the New Media Academy, Alia Al Hamadi. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for two speakers. It's when he released the podcast, The Diary of the CEO. Um, it's interesting. So the, the probably the most remarkable thing about my first marketing company was that we didn't, we never had a sales team. And our clients were Apple and Amazon and Coca-Cola and you name the company, Logitech, Uber, we did their marketing across the United States. We never had a sales team. And the reason we didn't have to have a sales team was because we knew that it's a much better strategy in life if you're building an agency business to be a peacock instead of a salesperson, i.e. to attract the world to you. It's much easier to be a magnet. And the way that you do that is by telling really remarkable stories. So I would travel about 50 weeks a year. In 2019, I traveled 50 weeks a year. I was living in New York, running the business there. And every time I went to a conference like this, which I did 50 weeks a year, I would walk on stage. And instead of, you know, when people come on stage, I'm going to show you a demonstration. When people come on stage, this is what they do. They come up on stage and they go like this. Hi, uh, I'm Stephen, and I'm from X Marketing Agency. And um, thank you for being here, everybody. Um, I want to tell you about my marketing business. So. Here are some of the so here's some of the work that we've done, and here are some of our and people will fall asleep. They fall asleep because the brain is wired in such a way that it is receptive very very quickly. It's trying to figure out whether it can save cognitive resources or not. It's receptive to emotion and surprise. This is why Mr. Beast is so successful because in the first ten seconds of his videos, he grabs your brain. He says, "This is what Mr. Beast does with his videos." He, the first second of his video. I've put 500 people in that circle and the last person to leave gets a private jet. He doesn't introduce himself. So when I travel around the world for 50 weeks a year, this is exactly how I entered the stage. This is exactly why you were expelled from school. You are incapable of sticking at anything and you always think you know a better way. Don't call me and don't call any of the family until you go back to university. And with that, my mum hung up the phone. And the very, just in that opening there, the variance between the amount of people that, that were looking at me and how much attention I had is so significant. I would then tell a great story. Throughout that story, you would learn about my business, you would learn that we were the best at what we did, and then I'd close off the story talking about my mother, but it was a story. It wasn't about our company, it just so happened that I ran a marketing business. But it was the most interesting story you've heard in your life. About, you know, you know so I think that was really pivotal, and that meant that we never had a sales team. We just had someone answering the phone. We never did outbound sales. Up until the day that I resigned as CEO, we never had to call a client because, you know, our strategy was on stage storytelling and online storytelling in, in that exact way. And you're um, following the same path for the diary of the CEO. <laughs> the only thing because I've done, you have, you yeah. have a, a special entrance once you start each Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, think, I really believe that people underestimate the power of great stories and emotion, and I think they overestimate information. And one thing that I think is quite inherent to the diary of a CEO is it's quite emotional. It's quite deep. So um, that's a... Uh, that's a principle I have. But the big difference that I learned over the last, I'd say, three years since starting the Diary of CEO is I've learned the power of experimentation in a really, really profound way. It's something that I wasn't as clear on before, but in the last couple of years I've got really clear on. I've sat with Daniel Ek, who's the founder of Spotify. I've sat with Brian Chesky, who's the founder of Airbnb. And they all say the same thing to me. And then I've read through history, going right back to um, the founder of uh, James Watson, the founder of Dell, who was at one point one of the richest men in the world, I think it's James Watson. And then I looked through history, I looked at Jeff Bezos at Amazon, you know, he became one of the richest men in the world. And then I looked through all of these individual companies like Booking.com, and what I found inherent in every single company and every single one of these people, even Tiger Woods, was this idea that experimentation is your strategy. And I'll, I'll, I'll shed some light on what I mean by this, but just to give you the context of the world we're living in now, if you're 11 years old today, um, Ray Kurzweil, who's one of the futurists, maybe the world's leading futurist, the best at predicting the future, says you'll experience a year's change 
in 11 days by the age of 60. If you're 40 now, by the age of 60, you're going to experience a year's change in three months. If you think about the speed in which the world is accelerating, and technology is accelerating, and the revolution of AI and all these things, it's not a useful strategy to think that books and other people's advice and talks like this are going to give you the answers you need for your business because the answers are changing faster than ever. So the question becomes, how do you find the answer? How do you... Experimentation. You have to outfail your competition. You have to outfail your competition to the correct answer. Don't take my word for it. Look at Jeff Bezos' shareholder letter, what he says. In his shareholder letter, this is a two trillion, three trillion dollar company, he says, we have to be the best place on earth to fail. And none of you in this room probably know about the Fire Phone or Endless.com. These companies that failed at Amazon, but you probably know AWS, which is going to make them 70 billion this year. Jeff Bezos says, you just got to swing more, measure those swings, and keep swinging, because one in nine of those swings that you make will pay for the entire failure graveyard. And AWS is a prime example of that. But as I saw this, I looked at how Booking.com had built their website. They said we used to sit around in rooms guessing what the correct answer was. Then we went to this conference about failure and experimentation. We came back, we built an experimentation platform. We conduct a, a million, ex we conduct 100,000 experiments a month on this experimentation platform. They became the world's biggest booking website. The podcast is the same. Every episode is tested and experimented on about 400 times. I could, I could go into great obsessive detail telling you the, the, the level of experimentation we need. I know how much a quotation mark gives me in terms of click-through rate on any podcast episode. I know the difference between the, using the colour green and the colour red. If you Some of the, the new innovative revenue streams that content creators should focus on, yeah. uh, especially if content creation for those creators is their bread and butter? So, um, it's a really good question, and it's one that no one's ever asked me before. We have um, sponsors on the podcast, as people will know. You probably, some of you will be able to know what those sponsors are. The key innovation in the monetization of our podcast is I am a shareholder in all of those companies. And the other sort of point that I think some people might find interesting is I called them. They didn't call me. So, Whoop, Zoe, Huel, I'm a shareholder in those companies. So they sponsor the podcast. Um, in many cases, I'm on the board of those companies. But most importantly to me, I'm a significant shareholder in those companies. And in some cases, my fund has invested in those companies. So in the case of Zoe, which is a company that's literally like going like this at the moment, I think it's, you know, I can't share numbers, but um, I invested two and a half million in that company. I'm an equity holder in the company, they sponsor the podcast, and I'm heavily involved in the business. When, when I look back on some of those deals that I did, the company could have paid me, I don't know, let's say 200, 200k a month to sponsor. These are real numbers, but I'm going to cloak the name of the company. Could have paid me 200k to sponsor the, the show a month, right? Because I didn't, took an equity position, and those companies have gone well, my brother, who runs much of my portfolio, said to me a couple of weeks ago, he was like, I think you're going to make either 20 to 50 million a year in hindsight because you took equity in those businesses. So if this particular company hits this target that is, that is currently um, outpacing, over 2022 and 2023, you would have made 20 to 50 million per year. The biggest innovation for content creation creators is to own the companies you promote. And the key thing I said there was I called them. The reason I called them was because I liked their companies, I used their products, and so I could authentically speak to my audience about it. And that was really key for me. I called Rick, I called Huel, I called Zoe, um, because I thought they were amazing, they're all health and wellness related products, and the founders wanted to do business with me, so I think that's the, the most important thing. What's the next company that you'll invest in? So oh, that gosh. We, we give this insight to the old ideas. I'm sure with the podcast, the Diary of the CEO, you might also face the same, or even the content that you create. How do you handle such, uh, such let's say, uh, 
stoppage or, or creative blocks? Yeah, I think the question is what is creativity and how, and how might it run out? Um, I tend to think of creativity like in front of you, you have a, uh, a sky and in the sky there's lots of different clouds. Creativity is people connecting these clouds in new ways. It's taking that theatre show you went to and then you saw a chair in a design museum and then you, the two points of inspiration, maybe there was something about the colours of this rainbow chair you saw in this design museum and then maybe that theatre show they were using something with drums and maybe you bring those two things together where you have this rainbow coloured drums. That is the essence of what creativity is. It is connecting clouds in new ways. So how do I create more creativity? Well, the, the most obvious thing for me is I need more clouds in the sky. I need more points of inspiration. Where are they going to come from? They're going to come from the most unobvious places. Honestly, the, the, the biggest creative steps I've taken forward in my life but when I did something that was, made absolutely no sense, I spent a year working in the psychedelics industry and as a creative director. Financially secure, I left my company, my company got public. I decided for no clear reason to spend a year working in the psychedelics industry and help take one of the biggest psychedelics companies in the world, the Thai Life Sciences, public. I just thought it was interesting. Like when I, when I started working on a musical, I started writing a musical, which meant that I went and started going to lots of different musicals. I thought that was interesting. I've been DJing for the last two years on my kitchen counter. You've not seen me DJ, but you've seen our trailers, and you've seen the music that goes into trailers, the understanding of music and beats and rhythms. It's the unobvious things, the clouds you get from the most obvious places that create the most your most valuable creativity. Steve Jobs is the best example of this. Before Steve Jobs made Apple, hardware was pretty ugly in hindsight. But Steve Jobs took a class when he was at university, I think it was a typography class, where they talked about fonts and, and beautiful typography and design. And we went from the Blackberry, as consumers, to this beautiful keyboard-free panel of glass with this tiny little round button and then the user interface was absolutely stunning like nothing we'd ever seen. That was because Steve Jobs went to a typography class and a design class and so when he started Apple he, he believed in and knew the value of design so he went and got Johnny Ives. And it is, it's the, when you look at someone's skill stack it's always the unobvious stuff that makes them the best in the world at what they do. The things that are unobvious but complementary. And for example, in all of our industries, everyone in this room, for example, understanding public speaking or understanding music, these would, these would add profoundly to whatever you're doing right now. They'd put more clouds in your, in your sky. The last question, because time is 